Good evening and, and hello to all. And, and I'm really delighted to be launching this uh, year-long celebration of DPU's 60th anniversary. It goes back to the founding of the DPU 19, in 1954 at the Architectural Association, what he was called the D Department of Tropical Architecture. Then in 1957, Otto Königsberger um, joined the AA and was appointed director of the then Department of Tropical Architecture. He brought in to this unit, to that department within the Architectural Association, his interest. And that started shifting very quickly towards a concern with urban development, urban planning, and housing in, in a context of rapid, rapid urbanization. The whole of the department decamped to UCL, and this has been our home since then. The DPU 60 consists of a series of, of, of lectures that you would have seen, the poster of, and it's on the website. Um, Dialogues in Development, curated by Karen Levy and by Colin Marx. Uh, which you would have all seen. This is the very first one of all of these. Um, I'm not going to go through them. Don't worry. We've got a long, long evening ahead. Um, we've got a um, crucial element uh, of it with, to which you're all invited is the DPU 60 conference, starting on the 2nd of July, finishing on the 4th of July. It will happen here. Uh, there's a series of, of wonderful interviews with former colleagues, including several of the colleagues who are here. Then, then we have a, a continuation of uh, Pat's wonderful 50-year history, and this is uh, an addition by Karen and Chris Yap, uh, which is called a, a DPU, DPU's first 60 years, a short history. So what Karen and Chris are doing is updating this up to, up to now. And finally, there's a, there's a series of papers, working papers, put together by our, our former colleagues, um, which are, is called Reflections uh, Working Paper Series. Now to today's session. And um, I just want to briefly mention that this is, this is part of a, of a long-term reflection that we have internally within DPU that we've actually shared with others outside, uh, including the Royal Geographical Society uh, event last year. And we've, we've titled it Outside In, Inside Out. Essentially, this is about us looking at what we've done, but also how we've related to the world outside, the world outside uh, within UCL, but also beyond. And so what we've done, uh, or to be precise, Karen and Colin have put this together with, with other colleagues, is ask representatives of DPU's four research clusters to speak to this theme. I thought that it would be interesting to start, much like Julio did, looking at the last <coughs> 60 years. Um, Nigel Harris, uh, in the 70s onwards, started to talk about the city as an engine of economic growth, to argue about the importance of the city in national wealth creation and in the, in the growth of, of, of different countries, and to argue for the importance of the city when everybody else was looking at rural areas as as the focus for, for development. In response to these growing cities in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East, there developed something which became known as action planning, which my colleagues promoted and developed and thought about, basically planning, rejecting a kind of colonial imposed British style planning and looking to find a planning which had a methodology that could cope with fast-changing cities and which could also talk to communities in their involvement in the process of planning. A group of my colleagues, some of them again here today, who focused, uh, not, uh, who focused on the questions of housing, land and infrastructure. And really, these people put this kind of approach on the map in terms of saying, look, these settlements actually pay an enormous in the important role in the way that cities are working and growing, and we need to address them in a slightly different way. Looking forward, I think that the kind of scenario we face today, and for any of us working in this field, is that the future is urban. Actually, this reality is still not faced in many, many development agencies, development organizations, people who work with development issues. The other reality is that the growth of these cities is most often been accompanied by, on the one hand, enormous wealth creation, but in the hands of a few, 
And with growing poverty and inequality, we have to recognize that we can't think about uh, uh, universalizing a kind of planning. We have to start thinking about what is specific about particular places at particular times, understanding the conditions under which urban practices are being reproduced. And this creates a very interesting uh, comparative dynamic, which is, I think, something that the DPU is very, very well known for. The, the issue that exercises the urban transformation cluster is that, from our point of view, there appears to be a crisis in planning. Planning law and regulation seems to serve the interests of the few. We see large proportions of urban citizens being classed as illegal. At the same time, governance frameworks seem to reflect an unequal recognition of the situation and of inequality in the city. Our work in the cluster really, in a sense, is focusing on reclaiming the redistributive role of the state. We're not talking about state-led planning. The one thing doesn't lead to the other. Okay? What we're talking about is mobilizing the capacity of the state, which no other entity has in quite the same way in our societies, to actually collectively redistribute money from one source to another. We've tried to, to, to um, organize our cluster around three main areas. We seek to promote partnerships in practice in different parts of the world. We promote partnerships in knowledge production and learning. And ultimately, what we're also interested in is constructing collectively an ethics of practice. The, the, the second major area that the, that the, the cluster works on is, relation, is in relation to community-led uh, uh, development and really working with collective resistance and action. We're looking at examples and ways in which the private sector have worked with communities and with the state in transparent and accountable practices where they have made fair contribution to the social good. Finally, which is a really important boundary for us, is how does this all link into learning? How do we actually create in institutions and in the work we do the capacity for collective earning? How do city municipalities learn? How do communities learn? How does the private sector learn? We work with, with what we call in a sense, the next generation of action planning, uh, strategic action planning, and we work with participatory design methodologies um, led by Camila Buono and his team. And we have many, many uh, situations in which we test and try and experiment with these methodologies through a kind of action research process, um, looking at trying to unpack the meaning and the application of what social justice means, and also trying to deepen our understanding of our, the famous term that we inherited from our predecessors, the room for maneuver, which of course is, is a really critical thing, a room for maneuver for addressing injustice and for indeed exploring what we mean by urban transformation. So for the state and market cluster, the key issue that we'd like to see addressed during this year and beyond is the need to claim the concept of the market. Now, the market has played a key role in approaches to development, either as the force that's going to drive development to bring, modern, bring modernization, efficiency, freedom, and choice to places where um, people are stuck in traditional practices, it's, uh, they're inefficient use of resources, they're, they're, they're trapped in... Uh, they're, they're unfree in various ways, or as the rationale for developmental interventions, because the market is a mechanism of dispossession, of creating inequalities, um, and ex ex exhibits failures. Yet, despite the differences between these two approaches, <laughs> both perspectives tended to agree that the market was powerful, and both tended to leave the market, or the concept of the market, relatively unexamined. The starting point is to remind ourselves that the market is a conception of the world, and not the world itself, even if it's a, even if it's a very powerful one. And bound up with the market are a series of assumptions about how we should behave, property rights, the role of the state, 
and individual responsibilities. And even though the market model declares that the market should live outside of politics, the market model itself does not. So we need to, cl we need to claim a conception of the market because there are these, these alternatives um, that are resurgent, such as making markets work for the poor and approaches that look at the bottom billion and the business opportunities uh, offered by the bottom billion. So we need to offer an, alterna offer an alternative to these. We need to claim the conception, we need to claim a concept of the market because there are times when we're falsely investing it with a power that it does not necessarily have. And because our current critiques of the market come at the cost of having predetermined our responses. So typically we want more, uh, more public space rather than private space, more communal approaches rather than individual approaches. So we're not arguing for the replacement of one conception with another, which would simply be an argument about whether one model is more abstract or represents reality um, in a better way. Instead, we're saying we need to look at these interactions between people's processes of transacting and exchanging with um, where they are, what they're doing, the material world, uh, and, broader pro and other broader processes. We want to be able to ask questions like, how do markets create social value? How do poor women and men constitute markets? What kinds of exclusion do the operations of markets rely on? What kinds of places do markets validate? The cluster is not the first group of people to call for an examination of the role of the market in developmental processes, and we certainly won't be the last. But what we can do is start within ourselves, and over the course of this year and beyond, to constantly examine our own conceptions of the market and what this means for socially just development processes. So the cluster, if you look on the website, questions how multiple social identities have or have not been addressed through the policies, plans and practices of development institutions and the associated social and development <coughs> consequences. And really, the cluster is drawing very much on the devious history of work on social identity and its relationship with social justice. So there's a very well-established literature on cities as sites of diversity and also cities as places of emancipation for particularly people from subaltern identities, places of freedom and diversity. However, at the same time, I think there's an emerging policy discourse which also frames diversity as a problem for cities. So this understanding that perhaps diversity is undermining social cohesion and social rights through fragmentation and conflict between identity-based claims. And the problem that mobilisation around identity is often linked to what Amartya Sen has called singular identity, the, the mistake of thinking that we have singular identities. If we look at ourselves as having a singular identity, this leads to a problem of what we call intersectional invisibility. So if, as someone who is simultaneously um, of a particular ethnic group and a woman, one set of claims may eclipse the other, and this, this relates to particular problems. Secondly, identity politics are the way identities are mobilised to make claims on the city or on claims for well-being and governance often use the language of justice as a strategy to increase divisions and delegitimize others' claims for social justice. So a sort of divide and rule approach. And what we can see here is that uh, political elites, for example, who mobilize around singular identities have an interest in emphasizing one identity and drawing a very clear boundary between that and other identities. If we see that diversity can lead to these fractures or fragments, one of the sort of responses, and this is where I get back to this language of cohesion, is to say, OK, so what we can do is be more cohesive and effectively be all the same or have equal rights in a particular model of being. One of the problems here, I think, is that actually, if you look at the way that development interventions and institutions often focus on identity through social groups, this tends to reinforce some of these problems of division we talked about. So and a question, therefore, is how can engagement with social groups in this way work in tandem with engagement with social relations and the structures which cause inequality between these groups? Learning from these lessons, which again look at these two poles of diversity as division and forced cohesion, where can we go with this? 
Um, and this is very much what we would like to focus on in the work of our cluster. We recognize that diversity can lead to division and fragmentation, but at the same time, there's space for fostering solidarity across identities, learning the lessons from gender, through shared claims for social justice. So if we do this, this requires collective action in debating what social justice means, which requires working with social groups as political constituencies, but seeing how we can make allegiances through these. And how can the promotion of solidarity avoid both the sort of zero-sum identity politics, where identity groups are seen as singular and in competition, and also the false universalism of we're all fundamentally the same and equal. And so what we'd like to look at is under what conditions do diverse social identities act as a basis for shared claims of justice, and also what's the role of development institutions in supporting this. About 20, 22 people are now members of the issue uh, or environmental justice organization and resilience cluster. Many of the big core key assumptions that were underpinning development planning, the theory and the practice of development planning throughout the 20th century are gone. So let me invite them to leave. Energy is inexpensive, gone. Climate is constant, gone. Safe drinking water is, uh, you know, everywhere, to be found everywhere, gone, absolutely. I mean, who cli claims that now? And of course the idea, the more overarching idea that nature is robust and that can be tamed through technological ingenuity is completely gone. If we are talking about, you know, uh, sustainability and sustainable cities and so on, what do we really mean by this? And I think that, you know, again, here, uh, uh, to bring Swinger or Heinen helps a bit, no? They say there is no such a thing as an unsustainable city in general. Rather, there are a series of urban and environmental processes that negatively affect some social groups while benefiting others. And to this we add that probably then there is no such a thing as a sustainable city either, but rather a collection of social environmental projects as visions, visions, interventions that pursue and sometimes um, achieve better environmental performance uh, in certain uh, parts uh, of nature, in certain geographies, for certain social groups at the expense <laughs> of other uh, social groups and portions of nature. What we are concerned about is that this new culture, this imperative for resilience and urban resilience, a very, very fussy term, is conflating or assuming that issues of distribution, issues of justice are uh, automatically or hopefully in most cases, you know, including each other. And in many cases we claim, well, that's not the case, yeah? Where you can pursue, you know, policies that are going to make a system, a type of infrastructure and so on more resilient without any touching at all uh, conditions of injustice. Most of these battles, in fact, the sustainability battles, the environmental justice battles and so on, are not being played in the city. You know, the, of course, there are many battles being played in the city, but much more in the city to be. That city to be is, you know, it's a, a, a term to call something that, in fact, more precisely, we try to capture uh, with uh, people like Julio and Pascal, Matthew Mattingly, who is not here, uh, and, and many others, as the so-called peri-urban <coughs> interface. Yeah? The reason why we have to work, protect, and so on this interface is because this is the depository of environmental services and uh, capital that will sustain cities. A second theme or subcluster deals with questions of vulnerability and risk reduction, uh, production, reproduction, and reduction. Now, contrary to what FAO usually says and what we tend to think, this issue of hunger and food security and so on is not being just played in rural areas, affecting rural and remote areas, but pretty much also urban areas. Our interrogation has very much to do with the possibility of really looking at practices like urban and peri-urban agriculture as redistributive, very redistributive practices. Uh, the fourth thing, uh, which has a lot of density in terms of work, is concerned with understanding how institutional paths in the delivery, in the production of services, particularly water and sanitation, and infrastructure development are changing and articulated and so on. We know that this condition of peri urbanization without infrastructure is not a temporary condition. Yeah? It's not a temporary condition. This is how things are going to be. Where is that there are the spaces of convergence or divergence between extreme type of practices, where there are you know, uh, insertion practices or climate practices that are trying to seek you know, some level of change, but trying to understand how some of these interfaces, precisely because they create an interface, produce a space, a political space, for these transformations that can be sustained, brought at scale, uh, you know, and so on.